Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach, live from our nation's capital. Today, we're discussing how to spend money, color matching in the virtual and real worlds, the new Series 3 Leco from ETC, the virtues and pitfalls of owning equipment, and I can't keep up, all on Light Talk. <laughs> and this is David, coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. If you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. Woo-hoo. Yeah, Lumen Brothers, three of us. <laughs> and welcome, everyone, to episode 213. And right off the top, we want to welcome our dear friend and bass and guitar player for the Luminoids, Zach Bovre. Welcome back, Zach. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Okay, the, the, the question that has been pouring in from around the world, Nepal. Nepal. Especially <laughs> Nepal. To, uh, Korea, uh, South Africa, uh, Georgia. What is your bass guitar of preference? Oh, boy. Uh, well, I have a, a modest but fun collection of bass guitars, but my bass guitar of preference is a 1986 Paul Reed Smith Bass 4, oh, which I actually oh, go. got with my bar mitzvah money. <laughs> <laughs> the bar mitzvah money comes yes, through. Yes. <laughs> so, so was that just a bad year for bass guitars or a good year for bar mitzvah? Uh, it was It was an interesting year for both. Well, you know, the Paul Reed Smiths are my favorite guitars in the world. They're, they're beautiful, yeah, absolutely. beautiful guitars. A lot, you know, most of them are handmade. Yes. So, and if you ever go to Nam, go to the Paul Reed Smith booth. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. It's always upstairs. It's they 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 display all their guitars. It is just really beautiful. Yes. Really beautiful. When we moved to Maryland, my bass had a a, a mini reunion with its maker. Uh, we drove out there. He's near Annapolis, and we brought it to the factory for a little visit. Wow. Well, it's great to have you on the show again, Zach. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, how's your shoulder? You just had shoulder surgery. I did. I did. You know, I, I, my goal is to get in shape in time for LDI so we can play, you know. So, That's right. So We're there you go. There you a go. special Luminoids Unplugged concert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing my washboard and my spoons. Excellent. Or my bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> and we got the cowbell for Stan, so, you know, we're all set. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because you were ringing in our ears last week because we had your buddy Bob on the show Yes, yes, last week. Bob, my partner at Mode Studios. We had we were doing two mode weeks in a row, really. Yeah, yeah. He's our fearless creative director, you know. It's That's right. That's right. Well, that was a great interview. Absolutely. We really enjoyed it. But we had a couple of great ones. We had Paul first, right? Yeah, that was wonderful. And then we did Bob. And then today we're just doing a regular show, but that's great. It's good to get back into that. And then next week we have Driscoll back with us. And two weeks from today, we have two guests coming in. Steve, do you know who they are? I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. I'm, I'm thinking about my question right now. Just getting oh, ready to have Oh, you're that. just getting ready for the question. I just want that perfect answer. In two weeks, we have Mark Stanley and Clifton Taylor oh. returning oh, to Light right. Talk to tell us about a special program that they've designed. So that's going to be really, really cool. That's very so exciting. Tune in. It is very exciting. Yeah. So I, I want to know a lot more about it. Anyway, so let's get started. Steve has our first question. Okay, it is Timothy in Ohio, and Timothy writes, As we wind down the school year, I have production money left over. What do you think of Dance Towers versus Booms? So, you're you're expanding your inventory a little bit. (laughs) I I will tell you right now, as uh, lights get bigger and heavier and bulkier, I am leaning toward Dance Towers. Uh, you know, I've, I have, I've had a few booms go up in the last couple of years that kind of lean at the top, no matter how much cable is stuck on them. You know, it's just hard to put a big old uh, LED Leco out there. So I'm a big tower guy. And, uh, you know, what I, what I use is um, I use a 20-foot tower and comes in two 10-foot sections. I load up the bottom, stand that sucker up, and then I just uh, uh, use a chain motor to lift the 10 foot top section into place and bolt it all together. But the thing that I do on my um, dance towers is they're wide enough so that they can accommodate two lights side by side. So I can really get that kicker right down there at the floor and I can load that thing up. Uh, I got the idea from uh, 
Dallas Opera. They, they have a great boom. And because they're doing things in rep, they load that thing up with two sets of lights. So rep one is, I don't know, the downstage vertical. And uh, show in uh, rep two is the upstage vertical. They can even spin it if they wanted to and have a third light in there. So it's just a monster. But I love that. Put it on some casters. It looks a little scary, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it doesn't move. Well, in Europe, these types of booms are on casters. And there's usually a ladder going up the back of it. And uh, they're very easily moved, you know, for scene shifts and things like that. So that's kind of normal. And it's wide enough for two. But my question is, <laughs> and maybe we're going to talk about this later and let's talk about, is why are these lights getting bigger and heavier? <laughs> it's supposed to be going the other way. <laughs> I just don't understand it. What do you think, Zach? Do you like dance towers or regular booms? Uh, I mean, uh, the idea of the dance tower is actually very interesting to me, you know. Uh, I think a similar experience to Steve, you know, the Dallas Opera tech is really what kind of sold me on that. Um, But I also kind of feel the same way you do in that things seem to get bigger and take up more space. And it seems like that's the kind of thing where, you know, we'd want some kind of magical smaller device that doesn't even require some giant piece of truss or anything like that. Uh, But I will say, just to add to your comment, that in my experience in Europe, the chain motor is also used to move actors. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we use rakes. (laughs) We push them, gently push them downstage, and they eventually roll into the pit. Yes. So, you know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's great you know one thing we're going to talk again later about the new series three is that the the lens barrels on the new series threes are even thicker and wider than the older ones so they're getting bigger too they're getting larger so i uh, i apologize in advance if i mispronounce this name but uh tick in vietnam asks zach i am a student honing my skills as a projection designer and i am stuck How do you suggest I approach color matching between the virtual and real world? Uh, This is an excellent question, which is something that I have dealt with in my entire career. And uh, it's funny because I I don't know if I've mentioned this on the show before, but I come from a line of people who worked in theater and film going back to my grandfather, who actually worked... uh, Uh, He owned a uh, film developing lab just as color film became a consumer product in the 50s and 60s. And back then, you know, it was a lot about the the uh, the quality of the eye of the person who was doing the processing. And so it would be someone like my grandfather who was deciding what the quality of the red was going to be for Richard Avedon or something like that. Uh, what is the quality of this color going to be and how do I relate to that? And now the big challenge that we face uh, in the live entertainment world is we have all these different devices that mix colors in a different way. So I have a computer that treats color a certain way, and I'm trying to match it to a light that treats color a totally different way. So like, I mean, you guys know, I'm sure, uh, when you mix colors with light, uh, it doesn't affect the quality of the color in the same way as when you do in a computer or with paint or something like that. And so uh, for many years, uh, I was often chasing the color of gel. And, uh, you know, Driscoll, who used to assist me many years ago, who you had on the show a few weeks ago, he and I figured out a way to sort of extract the colors out of Lightrite so that we could make a simulation of them in Photoshop uh, to apply virtual gel to our imagery. Cool. And uh, but it was still a a contest. And uh, I think you've had Chad from Roscoe on the show as well. And uh, Chad and I used to talk a lot about what kind of gel can I put in front of the lens of the projector? Because I'm using a projector that has a kind of lamp or multiple lamps that produces a different quality of light than any kind of lighting fixture does. But if I use the same gel, you know, if I have a uh, same blue gel in front of my projector that you have in front of your light, then at least I can get into your world a lot closer. Um, so we always joked that I wanted him to develop this Borove yellow color. <laughs> Borove uh, yellow. Yeah. Uh, that I gotta Which, see. <laughs> yeah. It, and that was sort of born out of this idea, you know, working with, uh, especially with a lot of British lighting designers where they do a lot of things with this many, a million shades of white. Uh, <laughs> That uh, that I, I did a show where we had all black and white projections, but um, you know when you're doing 
a live theater, the, the audience perception of what is white, what is black, what is blue is whatever you tell them it is. You know, uh, if you have an all white set and you create like a blue state, you can say this is our blackout. And people will just sort of accept this is the language of that. Uh, that being said, as we move now into these virtual things with the extended reality stuff, where you have a combination of a computer with a virtual lighting fixture, and then you might have an actual lighting fixture like an LED lighting fixture or something else, uh, the goal or the hope is that at some point we'll develop some kind of universal uh, tool for measuring the quality of color. So we can all just say, okay, everybody dial in seven, six, three, five, four, and we'll all go to the same color, you know, sort of like Pantone, but even a step further. So I, I hope that we're going that way. Uh, for now, I think it's a lot of trial and error. Um, the, the magic of the post-production is that you can make anything all one color very easily. You can match things later in the computer. I mean, when you watch these videos uh, about like The Mandalorian, that TV right. show, which is shot in extended reality, right. what you see on the screen in post-production, it's amazing how how manipulated it, every little aspect of it is compared to what they shoot. Uh, and that the tools have gotten so fast that we're doing you know, 75, 80, 90% of that in real time. And then they're just sort of, you know, final polish at the end. Uh, so a lot of it is just sort of use your eye, talk to each other, do your best and try to prepare in advance. Uh, you know, talk to your lighting people and find out what colors they're going to bring to the table and then start with something as close as you can. That's really good advice, you know, because I actually wanted to ask Bob this question, but since you're really part Bob's partner, you can answer <laughs> it. <laughs> sure. Because you know, when when you're going into a show and you start and you're integrating uh, XR with real, you know, with with, mm -hmm. with live, and you also you're dealing with projections and things like that as well. How do you wrap around the color in your mind that it all unifies? Now, you know, we talked about this when we were talking about the Grammy show, because uh, right. there was a lot of that that was sort of done in projections and XR and stuff like that. Do you approach it differently when you're mixing XR with live? Uh, I think somewhat. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, like, as I said, the more preparation um, is definitely your friend here because you want to kind of go in there knowing what you think in advance might be the trouble spots so that you can start by working on that. You know, start by looking at the things that you think aren't going to match. Start by thinking about like, where's the edge of this thing? And let's look at, let's focus for a minute on the edge so we can make sure that the real and the virtual blend in that spot and then we can you know start with that zoomed in idea and then back up and back up and back up you know sort of like the way you might do if you were retouching an image like a photograph where you'd start with what's the problem area and then how do i blend it in around that and blend it in beyond that and blend it in beyond that until i've created this big picture but it's sort of like getting to the point where you know where the problem spots might be in advance is how you prepare for that, I think. That's interesting. And who has the final say when, when you are doing the final the director? <laughs> yeah. So the director's there with, with the, the lighting director and whoever's doing the XR, right? And right. He basically is finally saying, no, this isn't working. The lighting needs to be a little warmer, right? Right. Okay, right. cool. That's, that's fascinating to me. I mean, to me, that's yeah. Just... I mean, and if you really want to do a deep dive, you can look into like the technology they used for uh, that John Favreau Lion King remake right. from a few years ago. It's where, fabulous. Yeah. yeah, the whole world was created in three D models, and then they were able to use virtual cameras and move them around as if they were physical objects to get the angles they want and to get the camera shots they want. Because part of this too is we as an audience still, uh, in order to believe it, we need to see certain things that we're familiar with, whether it's a camera angle or whether it's the quality of light in a certain way. Uh, and so finding these tools that can blend those things to sort of push the envelope, but also give us enough that we buy into it uh, are really, the, that's the trick to making it all work. That's really cool. 
Steve, do you have anything? Do you want to add to this? Uh, uh, no, I'm feverishly taking notes because this is like <laughs> this is like a master master class. It is. That's why we're talking about it. <laughs> we should charge for this episode. I forgot to ask Bob this last <laughs> week, and I wanted to ask an expert that we just did. So that's great. <laughs> Keep in mind the way the technology moves. That by Saturday, when this comes out, <laughs> it may be all different by then. <laughs> that's really funny. Daniel in Virginia writes: You have spoken about working over rehearsals. How much do you have in the console before you start, and how much do you really have planned out prior to working over the rehearsal? Everything is moving too fast for me, and I can't keep up. Oh, <laughs> I'm falling, <damn>. and I <laughs> can't get up. <laughs> well, okay, I'm going to tell you the truth here. Uh, <laughs> I, as, as you know, if you're a regular listener show, I, I treat lighting like I treat music, and I sort of like treat the whole process very similar to the way I treat playing in a band. And uh, like when you learn a song, you learn the song, you learn, you know what the arrangement's going to be. You usually know what key it's going to be in. And then when you play it live, you listen to each other and all that can change. Even though you're playing the arrangement, what happens between the bars could be all improvisational. It's jazz. And that's how jazz players play. And when I approach a show, I pretty much know the color of the atmospheres are going to be, you know, what the shapes of the atmospheres are going to be. I have a good idea where, what, what the transitions are. I know where the cues are probably going to be. But like music, that could change depending on what's happening around you because theater is very, very fluid, especially this part of the process when you're into theater. So uh, that's pretty much what I do. I don't put anything in the board because I'm not a programmer. And I have, a, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to be using. And I have a pretty good idea of where the focus is going to be. So uh, that's the best way I can answer it. How about you guys? Well, I, I can tell you a quick story. Uh, one of my earliest jobs on Broadway was assisting and programming for Wendell Harrington on the musical Grey Gardens. And we were hired specifically to create an animation moment that was the end of act one. And by the time the show opened, that had been cut and we had created projections for almost the entire rest of the show. <laughs> so <laughs> as much as we Things prepared change. and prepared, yeah. But I think the secret to all of this is, you know, even though I jokingly said, I can't keep up, is to keep a cool head. Yeah. And you don't have to, ex I don't want to say you have, should accept that you can't keep up because sort of using the playing in a band metaphor, like as long as you know where the downbeat is, you're going to be okay. So it's okay to have to change the plan. So not getting frustrated or flummoxed or being coming to a standstill if you have to turn on a dime is the secret I found to being able to to do this because you're going to reinvent the show at least three times during tech anyway. So just go into it knowing that's going to happen. That's what makes it fun. And uh, yeah. there, there's, you know, continuing with the band metaphor, that it's also really important to know how to start the song and end the song. If you know that and you right. know what key it is and you have an idea what the arrangement is, you, you're fine. So have fun. Right. Well, I agree. I mean, it, it, is, it is about turning on a dime. It is about having seven ideas when you come into that tech. It's about having a plan on, on where you're heading. And if you're heading in the wrong direction and it's just ugly – then you, you need to turn and do something else. You also need to you know, have the courage to kind of uh, turn to the director and say, uh, you know, I'm working over the rehearsal. We, we agreed that I should do this. I just need a second to catch up. And nine times out of ten, they're going to say, sure, just don't black out the stage. Let's get caught up. Let, let me know when you're caught up. They may be pushing on in more blocking or more conversation on stage. Uh, but I, I prefer working, working live. And it is so much easier. You don't always have that opportunity. You know, I've gone into places where it really kind of has to be in the console when I get there. But if I can work with the director and the actress in the space, I always think it's a better, better experience for everyone. Well, it's also, it's like what Paul says. I mean, get the broad strokes done. Get those big broad strokes recorded. All the stuff, the you know, little focus cues and the little dynamics that may change during the the scene, you can put those in later. You can add them in over rehearsals, but just get those broad strokes done and get something in the board. You don't want to get through that first rehearsal with only like two scenes out of eight scenes done. 
And they continued. They got through eight scenes, but you you got so lost that you're still trying to fix other stuff. Push forward. Push forward. You'll get that other stuff done later. I found that directors don't like to be told, <laughs> I got to wait. You got to hold on a second for the most <laughs> part. I must just tell you that they get very nervous at that point. And you just say, okay, I'll fix that later. And that's okay. You can say, that. I'll fix that later and move on. And I always do that. I have a cue list that I pre-write. And when I record a cue, I highlight that cue, my cue list in yellow. If I need to come back and work on it, I put it in blue. And I do this. And, and maybe uh, in one scene, there may be eight cues, but maybe only one of them I wrote. And the other ones are in green because I know that they're minor things I can come back so that when I come back and I actually record these other cues, I change those to yellow. So I know exactly what's done and what's not done. And if I cut a cue, it's in red, but I always keep the cue there so I know what I cut and make sure that the stage manager knows also. So organization is a big part of it as well. But don't freak out that you're falling behind because you're really not. You're actually working over the show and you're getting ideas. And usually when you go home that night, you'll say, oh, now I know what to do in that scene. You know, when I, when I was young and naive and just starting in opera, uh, a conductor hired me. And he hired me because of my improvisational work. And he said, what we need is I want you to be a partner in this. Now, now I was young and stupid. He said, I want you to be a partner. So at the piano tech, you know, you just, you just let me know. Here, we're going to give you a light switch. And whenever you want me to stop, flip the switch oh, and a God. light will go off. <laughs> and so I thought, this is great. So, you know, we start and I'm chugging along there and I flip the switch and uh, he stops. He stops the piano wow. tech and he turns around <laughs> he sa- and he says, Steve, this is exactly why you're here. This is exactly wow, why I've I never heard a conductor you. do thank, this. That's crazy. Thank you so much. This is how we're going to get it right. Uh-huh. And I said, thanks. And then he turned around and there was the downbeat immediately. Of course. <laughs> so he started playing again. <laughs> so I realized that there was no point in flipping that switch no, ever again. <laughs> he was going to continue no matter what. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you guys definitely, I will say, uh, in the projections world, I've always been jealous in that <laughs> for lighting designer, you know, as long as you don't go to a blackout in the middle of rehearsing a song, right. you can kind of get away with, I'm working, I'm working. But like, if I bring up an image that's the wrong image, oh. everybody looks at your image and they can't just go, oh, he's working on that other song right now. <laughs> They'll yell, that's the wrong image. <laughs> yes. They, I, can't, I can't rehearse this with that up there. Why is there a 30-foot cockroach up on the screen? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's for act you, you, four. <laughs> right, right. You know, I saw Hal Binkley working on uh, a dance at the Joyce uh, one evening. And, uh, you know, it's tech. He's kind of working through, working over dance. And he probably created the world's ugliest light cue. I mean, it was like a Pepto-Bismol psych. And he just stood up at the tech table and turned around to everybody and said, I'm really sorry. I'll never do that again. And just went back to work. <laughs> That's good. You know, now that you're kind of a pseudo Lumen brother, maybe your stock is going up and you can just turn and stop these rehearsals. Yeah, I'm going to get my own light switch. <laughs> Wait a second. He's not a go. pseudo <laughs> Lumen brother. He is a Lumen brother. Pseudo. No. No, no. <laughs> he, you. you are the A, the Lumen brother. I'm, I'm not questioning his ability to play a bass no, guitar. No, you're not. You're not. But you said pseudo Lumen brother. He's, he is a Lumen brother. We're all Lumen brothers. <laughs> Sounds good. It's like a Disney production. <laughs> We're all Lumen brothers. <laughs> yes, it's a Lumen after all. You are listening to Light Talk, and today's episode is sponsored by... A public service announcement from No More 10 Out of 12s. A group of rowdy beavers is being blamed for causing a town in British Columbia to lose its internet, phone, and cable TV services past weekend by chewing through the fibers and using them to build their little houses. The beaver menace could move across our northern border. If the Canadian beaver can chew through an internet line, what chance do our American DMX lines have against the mighty beaver? Now, there are those among you who may reject the beaver threat. To you, I ask... Why is ETC working so hard to develop a stable wireless DMX system on their new fixtures? Is this simple coincidence? I think not. If you travel through Wisconsin, you're apt to see beavers all over the place. And many of those beavers are rowdy 
Canadian beavers that have crossed our border. What to do? That is why Bad Ombre Stage Productions has stepped up with a brand new product, Beaver Go Home. One part coyote urine, one part coffee, and one part raid. This handy aerosol can can be sprayed on your DMX lines and keep those beavers at bay. This has been a public service announcement from No More 10 Out of 12s. <laughs> and now, back to Light Talk. <laughs> Well, the sound of those crazy rabid ducks tell us that it's time again for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about the new Series 3 Lico and Desire Fresnel from ETC. Now, several weeks ago, we actually did a Let's Talk About about game changing and that if this was indeed going to be a game changer. And, uh, and a lot of it was, it sounds great. We have all the confidence in the world in ETC, and it's probably going to change everything. But we need to see it. Well, the good people at ETC invited me over to their uh, Los Angeles showroom, and uh, I got a complete demo on these fixtures. Not on the Desire Fresnel, but on the previous Fresnel that also uses the same type of light engine. And I must tell you that I am very impressed. Uh, very, very impressed. I think they've got it. Not only does the light engine perform beautifully when it comes to color matching the 3200K, but it also has an amazing menu system on the back of it uh, where you can really dial in the colors. It has new side tilt clamps, which actually extend and uh, are very useful. And uh, I, I was just very impressed with the way it's designed. Plus, as we all know, it has that new inboard multiverse control system. So you don't have DMX cables everywhere. It has a little antenna on the back, too. Have you guys seen these guys up close yet? I have not. I, I, I'm, I'm being promised yeah. uh, to have one, to see one soon. Um, now, you stuck your hand out and turned your hand, hand all red. What did you think of that? I was just showing the, that was only that deep red LED on. That's why I posted so that. So you, you think that you think that really makes the difference? Absolutely. Because they actually, we A-B'd it against the old Series 2s, and it was a dramatic difference. It was a dramatic difference in color rendition, and it was also a dramatic difference in power. I think it's 40% brighter than the previous Series 2. Wow. Well, I, I'm looking at their spec sheet mm -hmm. here, and it says 13,000 lumens, right. which that's pretty bright. Yeah. yeah, it's almost as bright as the old 750-watt Source 4. Not exactly as bright, but almost as bright. Again, it depends on what color you're using, too. I, I'm just talking about when you got it dialed into 3200. If you're using, like, if you put a, a primary red in front of a 750-watt Source 4, and then you dial in the primary red of that ETC Series 3, I believe that Series 3 will outperform it when it comes to those colors. Did you, did you see it with the... Um New lens against a an older lens. I mean, since it it'll take it'll take any lens you want to stick it in there. It will take the older lenses, but here's the thing: uh, the new lenses are actually wider. They're actually larger, not longer, but but wider, fatter, and they're fatter by I believe about a half to half inch to an inch. I'm not too sure, but it's significant. Now it will take an old lens tube, but depending on what LEDs are used for, whatever specific color you're using, some of those those LED light emitters will be hitting the inside of the tube and not going out the front. And uh, we were looking at the color and it was about almost an inch worth. So we'll cut off some intensity depending on the color. Uh, and that's a problem. But in order to get that full array of LEDs in there, they had to go to a wider tube. Well, I, I do want to say in terms of that kind of stuff, the thing that really amazes me, which is something that I deal with all the time since the world of projections are so much about transitions, is how much time and effort and care and thoughtfulness that these manufacturers put into the quality of the shift in color temperature as the light fades in and out and how they try to simulate you know, the quality of that natural light in an LED. And I'm always curious to see when a new fixture like this comes out, because uh, I think a lot of times like a Verilite has a simulation mode and then there's just like a straight on and off mode, like a Tesla almost right, kind right, of thing. Right. Well, they did show me the transition, the simulated transition of a 
you know, going from 3,200 Kelvin to like 1,500 Kelvin. And uh, it was beautiful. It really was. But I didn't see like the simulation going from like a, a lavender to a, you know, to a Bourvre, uh yellow. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> seen that one. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen that yet. <laughs> but I want to see this Bourvre yellow, okay? <laughs> That's really what I'm interested in. But uh, yeah, uh, you're right. Absolutely. But I have a feeling they have that stuff together. They've been doing it for a while. Yeah, and that's what I was talking about before, like this idea that, uh, you know, everything can talk to everything else. And now that we're all really using pure digital tools, it should be much easier to develop some kind of language to have everything communicate and match the quality and color temperature to everything else. So what do you, what do you guys think? Um, when, when is the tungsten lamp going away? When are all of these, you know, millions of source fours just going to have to be retired? Well, when it gets cheap enough, you know, right yeah. now this fixture is not inexpensive. So you don't think we're going to follow the way Europe has and Australia has and just said, like, next Wednesday, that's no, it? No, because our politicians are paid off by all these companies and they're not going to just make a rule like that. And then you have nuts like uh, those people in Congress who think that it's infringing upon our liberties to, to create a <laughs> rule, you know. It's infringing upon my liberty to wear a mask. <laughs> um, is there an amendment about tungsten lights? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half. We need the other, we need the Alamo flag that says come and take come it. And take it, it right. has right. an incandescent well, but at, at bulb the same on it. time, yeah. I mean, you're, you have like millions of wonderful regional and community theaters that are just going to tell them one day you need to go spend a million dollars on new lights? Yeah, exactly. No. Well, you know, if there was a way that the government can subsidize it, you know, why sure. not? That'd be great. Sure. And then ETC would be building like five different plants making thousands of these lights. So, right. Well, I mean, th there is going to be a point. I don't even think it's the American government. There's going to be a point that the ma lamp manufacturer is going to say, is this not worth our time anymore? Right. right. Well, it's, I think that's also something that I've talked about with our friends at Roscoe, like, are we ever going to get to the end of gel? And then what do we do? Right. <laughs> gel is not the most environmentally friendly no, product. No, it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. So, just a couple of interesting notes. It is very front heavy, especially with this new lens train. We actually put a five degree, no, a 10 degree and a new 10 degree lens, uh, uh, lens barrel in there. And that sucker was front heavy. Now, the tilt clamps do hold it. But again, these lights are getting huge. It's like that new Martin fixture. That new Martin Leco is really big and heavy. So I'm, I'm just uh, uh, pretty amazed that, you know, why everything's getting so big again and so heavy again. Well, it's always been, I think, big and heavy in Europe. Yeah. They've never, they've, they've never been obsessed with uh, small size the way we have. Right. Well, that's because they have socialized medicine. That's true. <laughs> For your so hernia. So you your back, you go to the doctor, it's free. <laughs> I got a hernia. That's all right. Just go down the corner. The, the hospital's at the, at the end of the left of <laughs> the clinic. Yeah, that's pretty much the way it is. But, you know, I also saw that FOSS 4, which was that Fresnel which has been out for a while, but it's using the same light engine. And that is a fantastic light. I was very, you know, you always hear me on the show saying that Fresnels are dead. I'm telling you, that FOSS 4 is a nice, nice Fresnel. Mm. It's got like a 13 to 55 degree zoom, but it's, it's pretty expensive. We'll see. I think uh, once Martin comes out and then Strand comes out and they, you know, and they start competing, obviously it's going to bring things down. So okay, we'll new uh, sidebar here. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're seeing all this problem around the world with microchips right mm -hmm. now. So what do you think that's going to do to mm. Verilite and Clay Packy and ETC yeah. and Martin? Because they certainly do not have, I mean, their combined buying power is not going to even come close to equaling Honda or General Motors. So all of a sudden, I, th I think they may be in trouble because if I'm a semiconductor factory, I'm going to be selling billions of dollars worth of semiconductors to General Motors, not millions of dollars to a few lighting companies. This may slow things down, too. Yeah, it may. It may. I, I think things are going to be picking up a little slower, to tell you the truth, for a number of reasons. Yeah. Well, although I wonder if Martin, because they're a subsidiary of a subsidiary of Samsung, which is a chip manufacturer, mm -hmm. if that might give them some kind of edge. Mm. 
It might. I mean, they, I mean, they might. Um, they have more you know, direct take, access. Take, they might take care of their own, but I'm I'm always a little suspicious. Right. Who was that a few years ago that bought high end? That projector company. Barco. 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 Right. So all of a sudden you have Barco who comes in and, s- and they're selling million dollar projection systems. Mm-hmm. You know, do they really want to sell, you know, ten, eight thousand dollar moving lights? Well, it's, it's interesting when I think about Martin in particular, because I know that Martin is the predominant uh, manufacturer for cruise ships. Right. And that's a huge market, but right now that's a dead market. I see them. There there are four of them docked right outside my front window. I see them every day. They've been there now for a year. Yeah. Pre-pandemic, I worked on a ship and that company had enough sway with Martin to have them implement features into the lighting console that were not there because they were like, we have, you know, 30, 40 ships. Right. We have a thousand of these consoles. But right now they have no power probably because they're just in the dock. <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm buying Disney stock as fast as I can because that is going to become a monster, you know. Well, Disney's really doing the right thing when it comes to that whole Marvel thing. I mean, I, I, that, that, now we're really off the subject of let's <laughs> talk about. But boy, are they producing great stuff with Marvel. That's all I have to say. That's why the crazy ducks are in charge of uh, let's talk about. Well, they're in rabid right now. They're in rabid mode. Anyway, let's finish off the show. Steve has our last question of the day. <laughs> Kane in Wisconsin. Kane, watch out for those beavers. <laughs> Kane in Wisconsin writes, do you own any gear? If so, what and why? Uh, I'm almost about to punt this over to Zach. Uh, the, you know, I mean, well, what's happening is uh, I'm I'm doing more uh, video and film work, and so I'm I'm snatching up a few tungsten fixtures and a little grip equipment, so I can just make a whole little package. So you get me, you get the you get the gear too. But typically, no, I I I don't own equipment. That's not something as a designer that I really want. Um, you know, it's it's. It's for me. It's money wasted. I'd, I'd rather just focus on the design and not have rental packages. Though I, I do know a couple people actually here in Dallas who have small moving light packages, like 12, 24 lights. And when the theater hires them, um, they bring in their equipment with them. So they get the designer who's quite good, and that designer brings in that equipment for that one big musical or rock and roll show that they're doing that the theater can't afford that equipment just to have an inventory, but they can bring this person in and it's like a, you know, one big package. I don't know, do you, do you guys own anything? I think Zach and I own the same stuff. We own basically musical equipment. <laughs> well, <laughs> he owns bass, <laughs> bass guitars and amps and I own Hammond organs and Mellotrons and <laughs> that's about it. What do you think, Zach? It's challenging, you know, especially in the video world, because, you know, I said this, I said this jokingly earlier, but if I buy something today, tomorrow, it's going to be old news. And so uh, I do own like a green screen kit. Uh, Luckily, green screen is still green screen. It's still green. Uh, (laughs) I have a camera, but I usually get a new camera every couple of years because the technology just shifts and changes enough that, uh, it's not worth it to to uh, use. I mean, it's funny because uh, when you had Paul on and he and Driscoll talked about that show where it ended up being cheaper for Driscoll to go to Scotland to shoot stuff. And I helped Driscoll put together a camera package for that. And it, it was a similar thing. It was cheaper to buy it than to rent it at that point. Um, but at the same time, you own something that in six months is going to be obsolete and you're going to get hired to do a show that's 4k and you're going to own a 1080p camera and it's not going to be high enough resolution. Um, so if, if you, you know, it's sort of like, you know, they say, if you think you're going to wear the tuxedo at least three times, then it's worth buying (laughs) instead of renting. Uh, so you got to kind of forecast, like when I was doing rock of ages and we knew that there was a scene in the show that we had to shoot against the green screen, uh, and that we were going to shoot it like four times a year, probably as long as the show ran, it was worth it to own a camera at that point. Uh, it, cause it was going to be cheaper and it was going to be something that was a tool I could use for other things as well. Uh, I own licenses for a bunch of media servers. Uh, and the reason that I feel like that's okay is that in many ways, it's like I own a dongle right. and then whatever computer I have is the computer that I can use to program the media servers, just software. 
at that point. Uh, I mean, it's tricky because, you know, especially when you work in theater, you look over at the sound department and they rent everything, like down to the mouse or down <laughs> to their pencils. And, and I, and so, you know, and we're sort of required to bring our own mouse. And I'm just like, I want to rent a mouse. I want to really? rent a printer. Yeah. But it's just, you know, this, this is part of the, <laughs> the history and tradition that we're sort of expected to have our own equipment. And I, I as someone who's also taught uh, projection design at the university level, the challenge there is like, it's one thing for me to buy a license of watch out, which is a couple thousand dollars. But if I'm going to teach a class and they need to have 20 licenses of watch out, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for you, uh, Zach. Sure. What do you use for a video monitor? If you're going to watch like something like the Grammys on television, what are you watching? What's your monitor? Uh, I have a TCL television brand, brand TV. Uh, that's a Dolby vision TV. Um, uh, that's something actually I, I was thinking about during the color balancing thing, uh, that now with things like Dolby vision and HDR, which is a high density resolution imagery that, um, high dynamic range, the, there's sort of an automatic color calibration that goes on between your TV and whatever your playback devices, if it's Apple TV or Chromecast or whatever. Um, but like in the newest, uh, in the newest version of the iPhone and Apple TV software that just came out the other day, there's actually a built-in color calibration tool where you hold your phone face forward to your TV and the little camera in the front that you use for FaceTime, like examines the pixels and measures the color temperature of the pixels and adjusts your TV accordingly based on that. Why haven't you gone to OLED? Uh... Because I have kids. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they'll kill it? Is that what you're saying? No, no I mean, he has college they, to they worry about. Clothes, they want to go to school. Oh, they want to play money. soccer. Oh, money. Yeah. They, want, they want food. Yeah, <laughs> OLED has not come down in price to the point yet where uh, it's affordable, it's affordable got enough it, got it. For, my, okay. for my home. Okay, got it. Well. we'll see how business comes back after the pandemic's well, over. I maybe. suggest you sell those children and you buy an OLED TV. So. <laughs> no, I've seen them. It's, it's, oh, how? It's how old are your children? Uh, they are eight and twelve. I see. I, I started out with plasma, and then I had to get OLED because I because everything now looks gray to me. I mean, if, yes, if, yes. If it's, I it held on to my plasma gray. TV for a long time. Yeah, but then it doesn't do 4K. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. No, mine was 720p. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's great. Great television. Yeah. Well, the rocking sounds of the luminoids tells us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on LightTalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However... If you do decide to litigate the law firm of Flecked, Flocked, Flare, and Glare and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Washington, D.C., and from deep in the heart of Texas. And tune in next week when we welcome back our friend and guest host, Disco Otto, to Light Talk. All that and a new sponsor. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Thanks, Zach. Thank you.